So I don't know how many of you got to tune in to Fox News' town hall with Donald Trump, and initially I wasn't going to bother with it because, I mean, this is Donald Trump's home turf. They can try to make him look better than he sounds in actuality. But I started to see a couple of clips, and then I saw more clips, and then I realized this was a complete disaster, and I watched about 80% of this, and this was a bad look for Donald Trump because he kept face planting time and again and you know what's interesting to me is that this was hosted by donald trump's literal close friend sean hannity who he speaks to every single night note the conflict of interest there but i mean even sean hannity couldn't really do a good job at making trump look good i mean there were there were areas where he tried to kind of smooth out some of the really bad looking uh pieces so for example um we're gonna get to a clip where donald trump is asked a very basic question but then he starts answering and then goes off on some weird tangent so rather than like trying to rein in trump and get him to answer the question directly sean hannity kind of just like follows him into that new conversation it's a really weird transition but i mean you could see what they try to do to polish this turd to make donald trump look better but it doesn't work and this was a really bad town hall. Now, for whatever reason, Fox News is not very good at doing town halls or at least communicating a particular narrative during these town halls because during Bernie Sanders' town hall on Fox News, they were hostile. They tried to make him look bad, but like the Chad that he is, Bernie Sanders uh, did not face plant in the way that Donald Trump did. Donald, you're probably watching. How are you? <laughs> All right. I know. That's how you do it. And if you're a politician, like you want to you want to command the town hall, right? This is about you specifically. So you take control. But at the end of the day, this was not substantive at all. Donald Trump repeated himself multiple times and it was a really bad look for him. And he keeps digging like he sees the poll numbers. He sees the writing that's on the wall. And if things don't change, he's going to lose. And right now he's kind of flailing. Like he doesn't know what to do to save his campaign. And you kind of see that desperation here through this town hall. It just shines through. So uh, the first clip I want to show you is of Sean Hannity asking Donald Trump, very clearly, I mean, this is like a really easy softball. What are you going to do if you are reelected? What's your agenda? Trump was incapable of giving any answers. And what is what are your top priority items for a second term? Well, one of the things that will be really great, you know, the word experience is still good. I always say talent is more important than experience. I've always said that. But the word experience is a very important word. It's in a very important meaning. I never did this before. I never slept over in Washington. I was in Washington, I think, 17 times. All of a sudden, I'm president of the United States. You know the story. I'm riding down Pennsylvania Avenue with our first lady, and I say, this is great. But I didn't know very many people in Washington. It wasn't my thing. I was from Manhattan, from New York. Now I know everybody. And I have great people in the administration. You make some mistakes, like, you know, an idiot like Bolton. All he wanted to do is drop bombs on everybody. You don't have to drop bombs on everybody. You don't have to kill people. If, John, if John Bolton, in fact, released classified material, should he be prosecuted? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Well, he did release classified. Actually, he had a, a judge said... Notice how based Sean Hannity swooped in to um, kind of guide Trump into the discussion about John Bolton because he saw that Trump clearly can't answer this basic question. He wants to talk about John Bolton, so I can't make Donald Trump look bad and try to rein him in and ask him, Mr. President, we're talking about your agenda in your second term. So he just kind of followed him, which I think is what you would do if you're trying to make someone look good. But I mean, let's go over what Donald Trump said. So he started to talk about experience, but since he doesn't really have political experience, and if you're going to compare experience with a career politician like Joe Biden, who's been in office since what, I don't know, 192, like you're going to not really be able to make a solid case, right? So what he said was he, he started off by saying, well, one of the things that will be really great, you know, the word experience is still good. I always say talent is more important than experience. I'm trying to do the Trump hand motions, if you haven't noticed. I've always said that. But the word experience is a very important word. It has important meaning. I never did this before. I never slept over in Washington. I think it was Washington. I think I was in Washington 17 times. And all of a sudden, I'm president of the United States. And you know the story. I'm riding down Pennsylvania Avenue with the First Lady. And I say, this is great. None of that makes sense. That was what he said in response to a question about your agenda for your second uh, term. I mean, if you're Donald Trump, this should be easy, right? We're going to finish the wall. We're going to stop COVID-19. We're going to get the economy on track. He literally starts talking about experience. 
okay. <laughs> <laughs> After he gave that answer, I mean, it wasn't a coherent answer, but words came out of his mouth. So, I mean, take it as a win if you're a Trump supporter. He then moved on to criticizing Joe Biden because Joe Biden is unable to articulate himself. He can't answer a single question without going on nine different tangents, and he's going to criticize someone else for not being very eloquent. And on top of that, as he ironically criticizes Joe Biden, he then goes on to inadvertently admit that he thinks Joe Biden is going to beat him in November. He's a guy who doesn't talk. Nobody hears him. Whenever he does talk, he can't put two sentences together. I don't want to be nice or unnice, okay? But, I mean, the man can't speak. And he's going to be your president because some people don't love me, maybe. And, you know, all I'm doing is doing my job. Don't forget, before the China plague came in, and it's a China plague, before that came in, we had the best job numbers we've ever had. We had the best economy we've ever had. He's going to be your president. Is it obvious that Joe Biden is in cognitive decline? Yes, I see it. We all see it. It's obvious. However, if you are also very obviously in cognitive decline, if you can't even spit out a coherent sentence to criticize someone who is in cognitive decline, then you yourself shouldn't be speaking on this because in criticizing Joe Biden for this, you initiate this conversation about mental stability. And we don't want to talk about that for Donald Trump because you are very clearly not mentally fit to be president. You are very clearly struggling to articulate yourself as well. So, I mean, if I'm Donald Trump, I'm veering far away from this talk of cognitive decline because, I mean, look at Donald Trump. He can't talk himself. I mean, he says words. But nothing he says makes sense. But um, that wasn't the only ironic piece of this town hall because Donald Trump then proceeded to lambast the media's bias. Um, and he does this on the most biased network in the country, Fox News. But of course, they're not who he's talking about because they're good since they do propaganda for him. The level of dishonesty in the media is, I think they're the most dishonest people I've ever dealt with. Now, not everybody, you have honest, you're an honest journalist, you're... A great journalist. The media is just so dishonest. They're not trustworthy. Except for you, Sean Hannity, my personal friend who I speak with every single night. I mean, if you're going to talk about media bias, then Fox News has to be part of that conversation. They just have to be. All corporate media is biased. They have a pro-corporate establishment slant, but Fox News is one of the worst offenders. Since a Republican is in the White House, they have functionally become state media. So to talk about media bias, but, you know, make an exception for Don for uh, Fox News when you're Donald Trump, I mean, it shows that you're disingenuous. You just want the media to not be adversarial against you. That's what this is about. Now, he moved on and he was talking about the protesters, once one of the attendees asked him what he's going to do to stop the scary protesters, and Donald Trump then proceeded to go on a rant against the PC police, but he included Republicans in this rant and claimed that they're the ones who are actually too PC. So I'll play the clip for you, then we'll talk about the implications, what he means by this. The Republicans have to get tougher, and I'm telling them all the time, because they're sitting back, they want to be politically correct, they think, oh, it's terrible to say something bad. No, no, no. I told him, you'll see. If anyone attacks, I stopped it the other night. I stopped it a number of times. But you'll see what's happening. And we told him, every night we're going to get tougher and tougher. And at some point, there's going to be retribution, because there has to be. These people are vandals, but they're agitators. But they're really, they're terrorists, in a sense. Okay, so let's think through the implications of this. This far-right extremist psychopathic party of death and destruction isn't apparently tough enough for Donald Trump, and they're being too PC. So in what world could he even imagine Republicans being tougher than they already are, being anti-PC as they already are? Well, what he wants is for Republicans to be more like Tom Cotton and Matt Gates, where they literally explicitly suggest that we should hunt down Americans and extrajudicially murder them. That's what he's implying here because he talked about retribution. So if you're not talking about being more like Matt Gates, where he says we should treat Antifa like the terrorists in the Middle East, then what else are you talking about? I mean, there's no other um, conclusion that you could take away from that, right? So, I mean, what he's saying here um, to suggest that Republicans should be tougher is quite literally just them being insane. Like, they can't be any tougher 
or any anti-PC than they already are without becoming full-blown fascistic, right? Uh, but he moves on. So he uh, starts talking about the radical left and the threat that they pose to the country. And he ends up backing himself into this weird argument where he's defending Elliot Engel. Yes, that Elliot Engel. And he begins critiquing the radical left in a way that's very familiar once he loses his train of thought. So he just, uh, you know, resorts to an easy argument. Venezuela. Elliot Engel was a pretty mainline guy. He lost by like 37 points or so. He got just, he just got killed in the election we just had yesterday. He was supposed to be a shoe in and he got hit by a strong far left candidate. Uh, you have a couple of other Congress men and women that probably are going to lose or are going to lose very close, too close to call. Look at what's happened to the Democrats. And these are real lefties. These are people that, that, take a look at Venezuela. Venezuela. They're bad. Venezuela. I don't know what else to say. Venezuela. You know, fill in the rest. I mean, this is such a lazy argument. Nobody takes this argument seriously. It is literally a meme to say Venezuela because Republicans say it so much. It is not an argument. It is the absence of an argument. But I mean, he has nothing else and Donald Trump can't help himself. He gets sidetracked. He's like a cat with a laser pointer, right? You see them that their attention is on something and then you shine a laser pointer and they're immediately distracted. That's what Donald Trump is, except with like thoughts in his head, right? They just fly by in his mind and he tries to grab onto one and then he likes that and then that one leads to a different branch and he grabs that one. It's just, it's nonstop. I mean, take for example... Uh, <laughs> this moment where he literally brought up impeachment, the fact that he was impeached, which you don't want to do if you're a sitting president seeking re-election, he could barely make it through a sentence complaining about impeachment without getting sidetracked, and he even threw in one of his greatest hits. You know, he, he had a perfect phone call. They took a, per think of it, they impeached a duly elected president of the United States on a perfect conversation. Actually, there were two conversations. The first one was, hello, goodbye. They don't even talk about that. The second one was about the same thing. They impeached a president of the United States. Now, in all fairness, the Republican Party was great because they got 196 to nothing Republican votes in the House and 52 and a half to a half Romney. Romney. Uh, too bad. Yeah. But he half of, a, you know, I, I call it 52 and a half to a half because he had two votes. One was yes. Yeah. Perfect phone call. Saying that doesn't even make sense. There's no such thing as a perfect phone call. But he said this now multiple times. Apparently, he likes it that much. He thinks it's that brilliant. Um, now, moving on, he proceeded to also lie about mail-in ballots throughout the course of this town hall. So now we have a mail-in thing. And you see California, he's sending out millions and millions of ballots. Where are they going? Where aren't they going? Is the postman going to hand them out? Are they going to take them out of the mailboxes? The other thing, Mark, it's very important. You get to foreign countries, you know, they keep talking, oh, Russia, China, this, especially China, not Russia, especially China. Are they going to print millions of ballots using the exact same paper, using the exact same machines? And are they going to print ballots and then hand them in? And all of a sudden, it's the biggest risk we have. Yes, it is not voter suppression or voter ID laws, which he also said that he liked throughout the course of this uh, town hall. It's actually mail-in voting, which is going to lead to fraud because, I mean, these ballots, they could come from China, guys. And if they come from China, if people get their ballots. I mean, when you put them in the mail, where are they going to go? It's not like they're going to go to the addresses that are marked on the envelopes. I mean, they could go to, I don't know, foreign citizens in Canada and they could be voting. I don't like his argument against mail-in voting. It ranges from borderline incoherent to just outright lies. There's no fear that we are getting ballots from China. This isn't a thing. You can look at the Heritage Foundation's website where they track individual cases of uh, voter fraud, and it's not an issue. In states where there is basically mail-in voting almost universally, it's not an issue. But he can't help himself. He knows that the only way he's going to win is if people don't vote. If more people vote, then that means Joe Biden's going to win. So he wants to stop that at all costs. So that's why he's lying. And I think that as a compulsive liar, like sometimes he doesn't even realize he's lying when he lies, but he knows what he's saying is complete bullshit about mail-in voting, but that doesn't stop him. Uh, now, moving on, if you've been paying attention 
the cases when it comes to COVID-19 have been skyrocketing. But he assures us once again that the only reason why it looks like we're worse off than other countries is because we're doing more tests, which that's not the way that this works. But nonetheless, he said it anyway. So we have more cases because we do the greatest testing. If we didn't do testing, we'd have no cases. Other countries, they don't test millions. So up to almost 30 million tests. So when you do 30 million, you're going to have a kid with the sniffles and they'll say it's uh, coronavirus, whatever you want to call it. I said the other night, there are so many names to this. That I could name 19 names like Corona 19, but I could name 19 names. But the fact is that there's never been a thing like this. We've done 30 million almost will be there probably today or tomorrow. 30 million tests. That's not the way that this works. If we didn't do testing, we would have cases. We just wouldn't know about them. So for you to say that, that's not a valid argument. You're mishandling COVID-19. You're not taking it seriously. So you can claim that the only reason why it looks as if we're worse off than other countries is because we're doing more testing. But in actuality, that's a poor excuse. And anyone with a brain is not going to buy that. So for him to say this over and over again, you would think that he'd have some other lie that's more compelling, but he keeps sticking with this. On top of that, he implied that people with COVID-19 or, or people who don't have COVID-19, who have the sniffles, are getting misdiagnosed. But what does that even mean? You're the president. So are you? do you have evidence that people are being misdiagnosed, that they have a common cold, but they're being characterized as having COVID-19? I mean, what are you even talking about? We shouldn't have to ask for this much clarification from the president. But the fact that we do is embarrassing. Now, moving on, I have one last clip that I want to show you. We all know Donald Trump has mastered the art of auto fellatio. Nobody is better at patting themselves on the back than Donald Trump. But when he was asked a very simple question about what his biggest accomplishments as president has been, in his opinion, you can tell he wasn't prepared to answer even this question. What do you think is your greatest accomplishment in your eyes? So a lot of people think it's the fact that we will have, I think before I'm finished this term, we'll have close to 300 judges, federal judges. A lot of people think, because that's a, a record, that's a number that nobody can even believe. And part of it was that President Obama was unable to get judges approved in a large number, about 142 judges. So I took it off, got them approved, and then got a lot approved beyond. So we'll be close to 300 and two Supreme Court judges, great ones. And so I think a lot of people would say that. I think one of them, though, is our military. We have Space Force, which we've added after 76 years. We've added a new branch of the military. It's a big deal, a very important deal, because space is going to be very important. It already is. I would say the rebuilding of the military and the taking care of our vets. We had a 91 percent Sean approval rating the other day. The VA, the VA was a disaster. All of my life, I've seen these horror stories. I don't want to I don't want to really jinx it because they'll go around, find somebody that's unhappy. But you don't see that anymore. And our administrator, our secretary has done a fantastic job. And we're 91 percent approval rating with the VA. And we got Veterans Choice approved and Veterans Accountability. That's where you can fire people that do a bad job. You couldn't do it before. Very hard to get. They tried to get it for 50 years because of civil service unions, et cetera. You couldn't, you know, get it. I got it. And the other thing is Veterans Choice, where if they can't see a doctor, we have great doctors in the VA, but if you can't see a doctor, you go out and you get a private doctor. We pay the bill. And it's, you have no idea how great it's been. And it's actually, you save money, believe it or not. But you have no idea. We save lives, tremendous number of lives. And I would say that's an achievement. But, you know, we've done a lot with the largest tax cuts ever, the largest regular. If you look at our regulation cuts, Sean, more than any other administration in history, whether it's eight years or in one case more than that, we cut regulations. And we, have, we still have a lot more we're going to be cutting over the next month and a half, two months. So we've done a lot, and we're very proud of it. And uh, we had the best, uh, you know, until this artificial problem, because I call it an artificial problem. We had to turn off our country to save millions of lives, and now we've turned it back on. And it's coming back much faster than anybody thought possible. So we've done a lot of things, but, you know, it could be judges, could be the military. Donald Trump is his own biggest fan, and he still hadn't thought about what he'd be bragging about during a re-election at a town hall. I mean, is there anyone dumber than Donald Trump in the world? He has to be 
the dumbest person ever. His accomplishments, according to him, uh, federal judges rebuilding the military and privatizing portions of the VA, tax cuts for the rich, and uh, we had a great economy pre-COVID. That's because of him. It's not like all the other countries in the world were recovering also after the Great Recession 2008. It's because of him that the economy was good. Look, this people don't care about judges. Americans don't know about the importance of the federal judiciary, judiciary, generally speaking. So if I'm Donald Trump, I think this is an easy question. You see protesters marching down the streets. You say, look, we did criminal justice reform. I signed the First Step Act into law. I did that. I also gave you all $1,200. Did you see those checks that we sent out with my name on it? I gave you that. These are the things that I did for you. Reelect me. But what does he do? He talks about tax cuts for the rich. People can get their checks and see that they're not bigger because of Donald Trump. People are hurting now more than ever. So he doesn't know how to read the room. And, you know, this is evident when you look at his actual campaign slogan. It's keep America great. I thought that he'd go with make America great again. He's literally going with keep America great during a pandemic, during nationwide civil unrest. What a fucking moron. So, I mean, like, if he loses, then I think that what he did in 2016, it wasn't necessarily a fluke per se, but what it showed is that he was able to, as an outsider, see these underlying material conditions that are causing people to be unhappy with the status quo and establishment and react to that accordingly in a way that was persuasive to enough people. But now, as an insider, he has no idea. He's not aware of what he's done at all. He doesn't necessarily know what people want because he's in that bubble. I mean, he's just, he's going down in flames. And it's kind of beautiful to watch because he deserves this, right? Even at a Fox News town hall, if you can't pull this off, then how are you going to win a re-election? Now, I'm not one to say that, you know, his loss is a guarantee. It's a foregone conclusion. Yes, the polls look awful for Donald Trump, which I think is leading to him kind of fumble because he's, he's panicking. But, you know, things can change between now and November. But still, Trump's performance has been so abysmal. This town hall was such a disaster, so laughably bad, that, you know, if I'm on Team Trump, I am bailing. This is not what you'd expect from anyone who's even mildly competent. And I thought that Donald Trump was at least a little bit more strategically savvy than this. But to see him just faceplant time and again, I mean, it's embarrassing. Like, I almost feel like cringe for him. It, it's that bad. Mike is a total loser, so don't hit the subscribe button, okay? And whatever you do, folks, do not hit the notification bell either. Mike treats me so unfairly.